prayer. Our God and our Father, we come into thy house again today and we ask the Lord for thy gracious drawings near that would come, O Lord, uh, in the truth of the scriptures and in the power of the Holy Spirit that would enable us, Lord, to draw out of the scriptures uh, food for our souls. And we pray that our worship might be to the glory of God. Amen. And shall we sing our first hymn, which is 168? 168. Long as I live, I'll bless thy name. Shall we stand to sing? evening shall we turn to John chapter 18 and verses 1 to 12. John 18 and starting at verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words he went forth with his disciples over the book Kedron where there was a garden 
into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake. Of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Amen. May the Lord bless our reading to our hearts this evening. Shall we continue in our worship with hymn 394? Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood. Shall we stand to sing hymn 394? Welcome to the evening service. The meetings for the week are listed on a card like this that you can collect from the front door of the church, although uh, most of the meetings are in a state of pause at the moment because of the summer 
but the midweek meeting uh, on Wednesday night at 7.30 for a Bible study and prayer study is taking place here in the chapel uh, because the hall is prepared for the Christian worship camps which Lord willing take place from the 27th of August to the 1st of September that's a week tomorrow both here in and in Chapstow so your prayers are valued for the organisation of those the annual general meeting takes place later in September on the 19th and again that will be midweek start at 7.30pm followed by prayer very happy to announce and congratulate Harv and Jake on their uh, engagement and wish the Lord's uh, richest blessing upon them. Now we'll remain seated to sing a hymn while the stewards wait upon us for the free will offering. And the hymn is number 489, Come Holy Ghost, Our Hearts Inspire, 489. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we come again in prayer to Thee. Um, we ask the Lord that would accept us now in Christ, in His blood and His righteousness, as we come to worship Thee this evening. And the Lord, our hearts, we pray, may not be formal or dull, but rather they might be lively, engaged in the Word of God. It might be hearts of worship and adoration, and hearts which are teachable and humble and hearts which are broken uh, under the word of God. O oh Lord, we ask that would draw us uh, as we ought to come. Uh, make us, O oh Lord, uh, like those descriptions in the Beatitudes, uh, that we might be uh, poor of spirit, thirsting for righteousness, and all these things might be true of us, who are the Lord's people. <clears throat> and the Lord, as we think of the nature of the Christian, how different it is from the world, Yet that was our nature, but Lord, we have been brought to the knowledge of the Almighty. And oh Lord, we, we have come into thy presence, and we have been able to come uh, through the blood of Christ. Lord, therefore, uh, we come again this evening, we come to, to worship and to open the word, to sing, and to speak and to listen, to fellowship. Lord, we pray, bless the whole, we ask, O oh Lord. Um, this blessing uh, is a gift, and we pray the Spirit might come and might sanctify, might anoint uh, all that takes place this evening. 
and protect us from the evil one. We know that he's a, he's a destroyer and accuser, an accuser of the brethren. And he is the one who comes to ruin the work of our hearts, if he could, and to ruin the church. Uh, we know that he'll turn uh, brother against brother. We know he will accuse us to our hearts. Uh, he will bring confusion and chaos. But the Lord, uh, thy coming is what we pray for to drive him away and to leave us in that uh, wonder and glory of the gospel that on the one, one hand we might know the great peace of God and the love and the mercy, the joy of the Holy Ghost. But also we might know that, that strength, that building up, uh, that sense of putting on the armor uh, of God, that as we think of the various parts of the armor, and I think of the helmet of salvation, and how the devil will come and assault our thinking and our minds and bring thoughts. And Lord, there we might find the great struggle and battle that takes place uh, in our thinking. Lord, we pray we might put on the helmet today, the helmet of salvation, that would remind us of the gospel truths and we might be able to resist him and not to be uh, those who are oppressed by him, but rather uh, those who resist him and know uh, that great strength there is in our gospel. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, we have Almighty God uh, on our side, and our present and our past and our future is all to do with God. And even though we are in this very dark world, yet through it all, even in the darkest parts, there is that great presence of Christ and he can even lighten the, the, the valley and bring light into the darkest of places and as we think this evening of the passage before us and of Calvary and of Christ entering that domain oh Lord that is surely a dark place and yet it would uh, end in, in light and in the light of the gospel where the sins of men uh, were paid for and men would uh, die uh, to, uh, to sin and would be alive uh, in Christ. And yet, O oh Lord, uh, we know that this picture of Calvary is, is indeed a, a picture also of, of much that follows, that, that battling uh, with, with sin and darkness. And yet, O oh Lord, we know that we carry in our hearts Christ Jesus and the victorious and the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we know it is a, a difficult thing and uh, we are often cast down and we often might feel uh, like giving up, but we know that uh, as with the psalmist, uh, we come to that place only to find that thou art there. And there, O oh Lord, uh, from that place of uh, humiliation, uh, we come and know the exalting of God once again, the victory. And we pray you might so know so this evening. Maybe there are many here this evening who are downcast, who are troubled, and who are concerned and anxious. Uh, we just ask, O oh Lord, that uh, something of, of that presence of God in Jesus Christ might break through upon our hearts. Uh, there might be clouds over us but those clouds can part and the light can come in. And we pray it might be so for us this evening who are the Lord's people. Lord, we think of the truth and the reality. Help us, we pray, to live in that reality, live in that truth, not to live in the lies and the shadows of the devil, but rather to know that uh, emboldening and that edifying uh, truth of God and these things might make us strong, O oh Lord. We might know what it is to, to grow in these things. We might, through those who are not full of self, might die to self. And that is a great victory. It might be those who wish to glorify God. Uh, and that might be our main purpose. And there's also this victory. Uh, we might be those who endure through difficult times, trusting, leaning upon the Savior. That also is a great victory. Sometimes the victories 
uh, might not seem to be victories, but indeed they are. Uh, as we trust and look and trust and obey, uh, these things are triumphs. And we thank thee, O oh Lord, uh, that these matters have been placed in our hearts and we pray we might go on uh, today and know uh, blessing upon blessing and grace upon grace. And that would keep us to the end, O oh Lord, that would uh, be with us and that we think of the week which lies ahead of us. O oh Lord, uh, whatever day comes upon us, Lord, may we find thee in that day. And uh, we do ask for thy deliverances uh, because thou art a deliverer. Uh, we ask for thy comforts too because thou art a comforter. And we pray that we might prove thee, O Lord, and uh, prove thee today and throughout the week. And we do ask, O Lord, for a move of the Spirit. And even though it will bring the, the ire and the uh, anger of, of, the, of the devil, uh, we know that this is uh, our wonderful privilege to, to preach the gospel. And we ask the Lord for gospel success, for men and women to be saved, and for them to become godly men and women. They might be a, a move of the Spirit uh, that might move those from darkness into light, it might move those who uh, are the Lord's uh, into a greater consecration and blessing of heart. So that at the end of the day, we might know what it is to, to die uh, in Christ and to die as, as godly men and women. Lord, we pray, save us. We pray, uh, make us godly uh, as we obey uh, and we follow the Lord. Lord, we pray, help us and enable us uh, to become uh, Christians who can be strong in these days and stand in our time. Uh, we ask these things for thy glory, through Christ our Saviour. Amen. Well, shall we sing hymn 373? Thou Son of God and Son of Man, beloved, adored Emmanuel. We stand to sing hymn 373.
Well, shall we turn to John 18 and verses 1 to 12 as we continue in our series in the Gospel of John. And we move from the upper room in chapter 17 and cross the brook Kedron into the Garden of Gethsemane, and the place where the soldiers come to arrest him. So we enter a very different place from that place of intimacy and friendship, um, Christ with his disciples, uh, that private room. Here we enter a place where the sufferings begin uh, of our Savior. Indeed, the book Kedron, Kedron has the meaning of, of dark and murky. It was a winter stream particularly. And it is a picture, that very word, of how Christ crossing that brook and entering uh, the darkness which faced him, uh, this murkiness and this darkness which was Calvary, the uh, depths of Calvary and the sufferings of Saviour would endure were there, physical but also uh, uh, sufferings of the soul and uh, of, of his spirit. And so he would do that, he would go there, he crossed the brook Kedron to save us. He left this room and went into the garden. This was the first step to Calvary, although he was always coming to Calvary. But there is uh, like a moment, moment here, uh, this moment of, of crossing the brook Kedron. So uh, our account, verses 1 to 12, uh, begins with him crossing the brook and ends with him in verse 12 uh, being taken away and being bound. I don't know how you feel. But I don't like reading of the sufferings of our Savior, although I know it is our salvation. But such is the dignity uh, and the glory of our Savior. We esteem him so highly. It's just painful to read uh, of wicked men taking hold of him and um, doing all kinds of things to him. Uh, I don't like reading it. I find every phrase painful. I find uh, the heart is grieved uh, as you see the way men treated one so exalted. But it is, of course, important to read these passages because here we see something of the full glory of the Redeemer. This also was his glory. It wasn't just that he was the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Uh, he was altogether lovely. Uh, but also uh, his glory was being a redeemer and savior, and our champion, the one who saves us. And so it's important to, to read these passages, even though at times uh, they are uncomfortable. And so this evening we shall simply follow the events recorded in this passage, bringing in some other um, parts as well from other gospels. Um, in some ways it will be like a march through the passage, taking each heart in turn, but I trust there will be a theme running through, and the theme will be his willingness uh, to save us, and even uh, this very beginning hints at that willingness, uh, this departure from the upper room, and this determination of our Savior uh, to go to the cross. And so we start with the, the brook itself, the crossing of the brook. Let's retrace our steps somewhat. Judas had left to do his dirty work, you could say. And there follows our Savior's wonderful words of comfort and preparation to the disciples. Once he had gone, Judas has gone, uh, the mood changes, you could say. And Christ speaks with such intimacy and depth and revelation uh, to his disciples. And then he ends on a glorious note uh, in verse uh, 33, I believe, of chapter 16. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And then he lifts his eyes in John 17, verse 1, up to the heavens and prays, Father, the hour is come. It is glorious. It is dramatic in the best sense of the term. It is the great drama of the gospel, the wonder. It is real. It's not any actor taking place. These things are as real as real can be. But they are momentous. 
and they're full uh, of wondrous moments. And so he prays in the most heavenly manner uh, for, for gospel glory and he prays for his disciples and for us. It's as if, yes, he lifts his eyes to heavens to, to pray, Father, the hour has come. It's as if also he looks around at all history and all his people and he prays for his people too to be kept in this world and to be brought to him that they may see his glory. And knowing all which was before him, so he leaves the house and crosses the brook Kedron into the garden. And this simple fact, as I've already noted, but if I can emphasize again, is a truth of great importance that this was a voluntary sacrifice. He willingly went to the cross and the whole body language, all he says along the way, points to that fact. Despite the difficulty and darkness which he faced, here we see him boldly and bravely entering the garden. You could say crossing the borders into this dark country uh, where Calvary was situated. And he would continue in this way, in this vein, uh, this pressing forward throughout uh, as the Accounts unfold now in John chapter 18 and 19. You'll see him all the time pressing forward uh, to, to the cross. Despite the murkiness and the darkness of this place which he was entering, he went in to save us. And that's the great theme we find here. He went into the darkness to save our souls. We know, although not mentioned here, we know he prayed in the garden uh, John doesn't mention uh, this detail to us. Uh, we know he prayed and agonized with sweat drops of blood. We find that in the other Gospels. But this one thing I want to bring in from the other Gospels, because Christ will mention again to the soldiers, in this matter of the cup, he's going to mention the cup in this passage later on to the soldiers. And, of course, when he prayed in Gethsemane, he prayed about this cup. What was this cup? Well, this cup was a symbol it was an illustration representing the sufferings and the judgment which were before him. Uh, in this cup were our sins. In this cup were the judgments. It was a vile cup, you could say. The contents were terrible. The whole judgment of the world was in this cup. The judgment against God's people. In Luke 22, verse 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing... Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So dreadful was the content of this cup, which represented what he would endure on the cross and in the garden. He prays for it to be, be removed. Now, this, you might argue, seems to go against what we said earlier about his willingness and his progress to, to Calvary. Um, he seems here to to say the very opposite, uh, to ask the Father to remove the cup. But I think these words are so helpful for us to understand what he was facing. As so terrible were the contents of this cup, he recoiled at the sight of it. As God recoils at the sight of sin, so Christ recoiled at the sight of being made sin and the judgment which was with it. In a way, you could say, he was asking the Father, is there another way? This is so dreadful. This is so deep and dark and murky. Is there any other way that I can save my people? And then in the same sentence, he answers, does he not? And he says, in so many words, my will, not my will, but thine be done. Thy will, thy will be done, of course. Now, our Savior was in agreement with that will. But I think we will, we will grant this, this pause, this momentary pause. This was, you could say, the only pause. But it was a pause to, to, to consider. And it's noteworthy. It's so dreadful 
was this experience. So difficult was it for Christ to save us. He pauses before going on. It was an easy thing for Christ to create the world. It was a difficult thing for Christ to save us. And here we have an expression of it, the difficulty of it. But of course, in the same sentence, he presses on. And then we see the band of men entering the garden in verses 2 and 3. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Judas led them to the spot where our Saviour often resorted. And Judas was with a large number of Roman soldiers, temple guards, chief priests, Sadducees and Pharisees. It would have been a very large band of men. And they came in threatening mood with lanterns and torches and weapons. An army, you could say, was coming to arrest Jesus Christ. And despite the sight of violence, and this was the, the beginning of the violence, this was the violent heart of man stepping forward towards him to take him, to crucify him, to abuse him. Yet our Savior, we note here, stepped out towards them. There in verse 4, um, Jesus therefore, knowing all things that shall come upon him, he knew all this, went forth, that expression there, went forth and said unto them, whom seek ye? So he steps out, went forth out of what? Well, we don't know, maybe out of the grouping of the disciples or maybe out of some part of the garden which is wooded and saw them coming and so he, he steps out towards them. And that is noteworthy because our Savior here uh, not only stepped forward to them but we shall see here and throughout all the events of Calvary it is actually quite remarkable. He was always in charge of events. He was not only willingly going to the cross but he was very much managing the events and the people. And even though man was abusing him, our Savior was there in his dignity, we have to say. And in his kingship, he was a king of kings. And he was allowing all this so that he might save us from our sins. And every action of our Savior is noteworthy. He steps out towards them. He says to them, who are you looking and whom seek ye to be uh, exact? Whom seek ye? Because he knew whom they were seeking. But he asked them. He takes it to them. And then we see the confrontation between the band of men and the Savior. And here we see something quite remarkable. Uh, as the soldiers answer the question of Christ, whom seek ye? No doubt they had instructions from their superiors to arrest a man of the name Jesus of Nazareth. And so the answer to the, to the question, whom seek he? Jesus of Nazareth. No doubt not just one person, but a few people answer at the same time, Jesus of Nazareth. And our Savior replies with these words, I am he, or just the words, I am. And what happens now is quite remarkable. Judas, I think Judas is mentioned here because he was in this grouping too. Judas and all this army, these soldiers, went backward and fell to the ground. How remarkable. What a, an event. It is a, a scene, isn't it? Christ there. In many ways, the innocent one, the harmless one, who had no sword. Peter had a sword, but... Our Savior had no sword. And, and there, these men, these soldiers, fall backwards and fall to the ground. Was it the demeanor of our Savior? No doubt there was something. The authority of Christ, the way he spoke to them, the way he stepped out towards them. Was it that that made them startle and fall to the ground? It seems slightly improbable that these hardy 
strong soldiers would have reacted to one person in such a dramatic way? Or was it the words he spoke? I am. I am he. Could well be a reference to his divinity as the Lord answered Moses, I am that I am. Could well be in his answer there was a sense of God as he answered. Well, one thing is for sure. They experienced something of the presence of the Son of God. That's what made them fall. Something of his dignity and power and authority. They were in the presence of the King, the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is Jehovah, Jehovah Jesus. These Jews especially were coming into the presence of Jehovah. Whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I am. He says, I am. And they fall to the ground. No doubt I suggest to you a picture of how men will respond in that great day. When they come before Christ, they will fall backwards and fall to the ground. I suggest a picture here of the day of judgment as well as the picture in the garden of Gethsemane. But then see how our Savior in control of all this, has to recover this, this band of men. And he has to ask them again, whom seek he? Has to recover them. They were on the ground. No doubt he had to stand up again. And he, and he recovers them. Whom seek he? And they answer again, Jesus of Nazareth. And then we see in verses 8 and 9, a request for the disciples. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake. Of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Now we see at this point, there was a possibility that the soldiers would not only arrest Jesus of Nazareth, but also the disciples. Now we know they did not. But at this point in time, you can't be sure of that. And there might be a possibility that they would have taken Christ and his disciples. And so our Savior reaffirms he is Jesus of Nazareth and says to the soldiers, let them go their way. You want me? Let them go their way. Even though they were in a way deserting him, our Savior was also looking after them and allowing them to go. And we have here, my dear friends, such a wonderful gospel picture just in these few words. Our Savior was essentially saying this, take me and let them go. Isn't that a gospel picture? Isn't that what he did when he went to the cross? Take me and I shall die for their sins and let these go. Isn't it a picture of substitution that Christ says, I will go, I shall die, I shall suffer, let them go free. My dear friend, our Savior said that to all of us. Let them go free. Take me. He says that to the justice of God, not just to these soldiers. He said that to the law of God. Let them go free. Take me. There's a Welsh hymn. Um, there are some Welsh speakers here, so I'll say it in Welsh, first of all, that captures much of this. And the lines go like this. Grandewch y geiriau ddwedodd, pwy allsai ond y fe, gadewch i'r rhain fi'n ymaith, cymerwch fi'n ei lle. Which means, listen to the words he said, who else but him could say, let these go their way and take me in their place. So we have a wonderful gospel picture here. It is typical of our Saviour, that's what the hymn is saying. This is so typical of him. Take me, let them go. And that's what he did on the cross. Let me die in their place. Substitution. I shall die. They shall live. What a wonderful gospel. And the gospel is seen in so many ways. And it's seen here in the very attitude of Christ. Even though this was not the atonement itself. Yet what his word said was typical of what he would do in saving us. And of his attitude and of his heart. Blessed be his name. Our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our advocate. He is our savior and our redeemer. He is the one who is for you, my friend. And he stands in your place and says to the law of God and 
to the justice of God. Let him go. Let her go. I shall die. And then we move on to Simon Peter and this man Malchus in verse 10 and 11. Malchus was the servant of the high priest. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And so this incident shows something of the disciples' failure to understand the nature of the gospel and possibly had a wrong notion of the Messiah as well, uh, that it was some kind of political Messiah. And this was the moment which he will stand their ground. It also says something of the nature of Simon Peter, a man of action and also impetuous. And there's no doubt that Peter could have, could have killed this man. Uh, that strike of the sword uh, could have been fatal. He wasn't aiming at his ear, I suggest to you. That rather he was aiming at Marcus, the servant of the high priest. And most probably, Marcus saw the sword coming and moved his head to the side to try and avoid the blow. And thus had his ear damaged and wounded and even cut off. Now, we're not told in this gospel, but our Savior then touched his ear and healed this man, Marcus, and says to Simon Peter here in verse 11, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Well, as an aside, we just note that violence has nothing to do with the gospel. This is a gospel of the peace of the heart, of the spiritual domain, not of kingdoms and politics and legislation, but this is the gospel of the salvation of men's souls. It's a different domain. It's a place where Christ takes his battle, not into the fields uh, of this earth uh, where swords are drawn, but rather to the hearts of men, where hearts are overcome with the gospel. There is, no doubt, Christian warfare and a Christian soldier, but it's not of violence. It is to win their hearts. It is to bless them, not to kill them and destroy them, but to bless them. That's the kind of battle uh, we are involved in. And uh, we notice also the glorious mention here of drinking the cup. Uh, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Just one thought before we come to that cup, of Marcus. You must just wonder about this man. This man suffered the hand of Simon Peter, but then he was healed by the touch of Christ. That must have affected him. And it wouldn't be surprising that, though we do not know, that later on he became a believer in, in Jesus Christ. Uh, we have his name. It could well be that Marcus is in glory. But come back to that statement of that cup, because here again we see this march of willingness, this voluntary sacrifice of Christ, this great champion of our souls was heading to Calvary. And here he says to Simon Peter, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Now we see many things here. We see our Savior's glorious intention to save us. He says, this cup, I'm going to drink it. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to resist this arrest? Don't you understand? I've come for this hour. I've come to save my people. I must drink this cup. Get out of my way, Simon Peter. He's saying, let me go to the cross. Let these men take me. But also, not just with our Savior. This cup was given by the Father. It was the Father's cup. And here we see wonderful determination in the Trinity, in the Godhead. The Father, wishing to save us, gives this cup to the Son, and the Son receives it. And so we see the commitment of God the Father to save us. He gives the cup. It is his plan of redemption, and Christ takes the cup. Oh, this salvation, although we must believe in it, it was all done by the Godhead and by the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The crucial things were done by him. We must believe in it. 
but the gospel is his. And then we note, they took him away and bound him. Now we know in the gospels, the Jews tried many times to take Jesus Christ. In all those cases, they failed to do so. In some way or another, our Savior passed through their midst. They weren't able to take hold of him. In many ways, it's kind of a miracle. How could they not take hold of him? But they could not take hold of him because he would not allow them to. And he showed his supreme kingship and deity. They could not get hold of him until it was time. He was in control of these things. All these things must be fulfilled according to the scripture. And when the time was right, then he would die. And that's what we see here, of course. He allows these men to bind him and to take him. And so we see here again his willingness to suffer. All those who think that Calvary is some kind of mistake and tragedy, how little they study the scriptures and see the words of Christ and the demeanor and the attitude of Christ and the promises of scripture, we see that this was the intention. The gospel is not about oh, Christ being an example and we doing our best. The gospel is about Christ dying for our sins and making us right with God. And it is the opposite of our works. Our works will condemn us. Christ must come to save us. And so this is what Christ was doing. Even though man was so confused, the disciples weren't understanding what was going on. None seemed to know what was going on. But Christ knew what he was doing. He was going to save us. He knew exactly what he was doing. And the gospel was being worked out step by step by our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we see Christ here. And just to say one more thing, in case you think that he was just going along with the flow because he could not do much else, what could the sword of Peter do in the end against an army? But our Savior says in Matthew 26, verse 53, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father? This is in Gethsemane. This is in this arrest. And he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. 12 legions, by my calculation, was over 72,000, just for the record. But the number is irrelevant. A whole host of angels could come at his command. But apart from that, he was God himself. But the angels are mentioned just to make the point. And so our Savior was saying, don't you understand? I could escape all this. None of this need happen, except it shall happen, because I must be a Savior of your souls. And so our Savior continues. You think of that hymn. The hymn does capture it. Was it the nails, O Savior, that bound thee to the tree? Nay, it was thine everlasting love, thy love for me, for me. Same with these ropes or whatever they were that bound him. Do you think those ropes were holding him? Do you think that's why they were able to take him away? Likewise with the nails on the cross. Do you think those nails were keeping him on the cross and that's why he couldn't get down from the cross? No, it was his great purpose and saving purpose, his love for your soul and my soul. And how we should be ashamed by that, how poorly we love him, how greatly he loves us, how we should reciprocate our love to him and how he loved us and how his love is like no other love. He went to the cross to receive our sins. But we think of our record. We think of our poverty. And we know we don't deserve salvation. Period. We don't. But on top of that, our sanctification is no great show, is it, really? And our love for him is very pale. And yet, so great is our Savior that he loves us. And this love is a love of grace and of mercy. It's a love of God. And without that, we could never be saved. If it depended upon a man to save us, 
then that man would not have the heart to see it through. But our Savior had love divine, all loves excelling, and was able to stay upon that cross, was able to be taken away, bound by these soldiers, because he was going to Calvary to be a sacrifice for sin. Well, as we think of these things, the great sense of darkness which is coming upon us in these chapters. In chapter 18, uh, we cross the brook Kedron, which means murky and dark. And in the great sense, he was walking into the darkness. But you know, it was dark. But you know, it was light as well. As the motto of the Reformation is, post tenebras lex, after darkness, light. And it will be light. The darkness was very deep. And only Christ could endure it. But he did endure it. The judgment upon our sin. My dear friends, how dark is your sin? It's very, very dark, isn't it? And the judgment that is due upon it. And Christ entered this darkness. And you could say, this whole environment, man came at his worst. Uh, described in the Old Testament as the bulls of Bashan. The sense of snarling, aggressive bulls surrounding him and we see these soldiers and we see later on the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Romans and the Jews and they're just paying for his blood and there's something so unreal about it it's beyond what you would expect and it seems to have something devilish about it I think myself it's the worst scene in all mankind how men surrounded Christ and they showed themselves and we showed ourselves at our very worst and the devil was there, and the darkness was there, and Calvary, and the great suffering of Calvary, and the depths of the judgment of God coming down upon Christ, being atonement for sin. And Christ entered this darkness. Who can measure it? Who can describe it? By this we know he was victorious. And he endured the suffering, and he rose from the grave. And that expression, post tenebralex, which has a historical meaning, has also a gospel meaning. After darkness, light, light. Oh, may we know the light of the gospel. Well, let me close this evening with just some random thoughts from this passage, some contrast that exalts our Jesus Christ. Thinking of the betrayal of Judas and the love of Christ. You could say the opposite of love is not hatred, but betrayal. And Judas betrayed Christ with a kiss. Our Saviour loved us and gave himself for us. The lanterns and the torches of the soldiers, they came in this aggressive manner with weapons and lanterns and torches. They came to the one who was the light of the world. They were coming to the one who would be the Saviour, who was the glory. They had torches and lanterns. Christ is the light of the world. And then these weapons, the ears, they came to take away the prince of peace, the one who would give us peace. They came with violence, and Christ came to give us peace with God. And who is the prince of peace? And they bound him, and Christ came to give us liberty, to free us from the tyranny of the flesh, the world, and the devil, but to give us the glorious liberty of the children of God. He is the Redeemer and the Deliverer. They came to bind him, and Christ comes to loose us. We think of the children of Israel leaving Egypt, and there they were released from bondage, and they were redeemed. And so Christ is our Redeemer and our Deliverer, and releases us from bondage. bondage. What a difference there is between us and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the ways of man and the ways of of the gospel. There's nothing like this gospel. And this gospel excels all the man has to offer. Pray you might know the love of Christ, the light of the world, the prince of peace, and the deliverer, and the redeemer, that you might know him. For many of us, we do know him. And what we are recording here is a march to our salvation. As Christ went to that cross of Calvary. Every step he took was a step towards our salvation 
and our redemption. Well, I trust you shall make your way to the cross of Christ that you might come to that place, gaze upon him, look upon him, and believe in him. He is the one who stands out in this world. This world of Pharisees and Sadducees, of soldiers, chief priests, and what have you. For Christ is the light of the world, the Prince of Peace, and the Redeemer, that we might believe in him. My dear friend, speak to those who are not saved here this evening, that you have a soul, and this was precious commodity, and you're in darkness, oh, that you might know post tenebras lux. You're in darkness. You're struggling with conviction of sin. May the light dawn upon your heart that Christ might come and save your soul and light might be yours. Forgiveness of sins. Knowing God. All these blessings upon blessings that we can have in Jesus Christ. Well, shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we ask, Lord, that would take some of these thoughts and bless them to our hearts this evening. And we pray that Christ might be exalted, we might see that wonderful determination, that willingness to save us from our sins. And even though we often fight against it, O oh Lord, for those who are unsaved, and we who are saved can remember resisting the ways of God, yet our Savior um, would win our hearts and would die upon that cross and save our souls. Lord, let us just bow our heads in worship this evening and thank thee that this gospel is so different to anything which is in the world. It's the gospel of grace and of mercy. It excels all things. And we see the marks, the stamp of God upon all the words of Christ and all his steps. We see such dignity, such reality, and such wonderful honesty, but all revealing that he is the saviour of the world. So therefore, O oh Lord, we desire this evening to honour him and to exalt him to the glory of God. Amen. Well, shall we sing 387 to close our evening service? Give me a sight, O saviour, O thy wondrous love to me. Shall we stand? Thank mm -hmm. you.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.